Take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. And I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about preachers and preaching. I don't claim to be any great preacher. I like what Dr. Rogers said. He said, there are plenty of people that can preach the gospel better than me, but there's nobody that can preach a better gospel than the one I have to preach. Uh, he always said things really good, didn't he? And uh, what a great preacher he was. I uh, can remember when the Lord called me to preach and I was praying over that and I was thinking about what the Lord wanted me to do. And uh, I can remember just as clear as a bell when I was uh, in college, the Lord had called me to the ministry, but specifically I had just finished reading, by the way, the book of Revelation. Have you heard about that book lately? <laughs> and uh, we were in Gatlinburg. I was there with my mom. We were on vacation. My dad couldn't go. He had a my dad, whenever there was a train wreck, he had to go clean it up. He was the track supervisor, and he took care of all the rails and all that. And so a train had wrecked, and he couldn't go. So Mom and I rented a camper and went to the Smoky Mountains, and we didn't know anything about anything. And I could tell a lot of stories about that, but I won't. But uh, while I was in the back of that camper, the Lord called me to preach after I finished reading the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a great preacher. Jeremiah was born in a town called Anathoth. It was just northeast of Jerusalem. He grew up in the home of a priest. He was a preacher's kid, I guess you could say. And he was probably called to be a preacher when he was an older teenager. He never married. He began his ministry under the very righteous rule of one of the greatest leaders Judah ever had, and that was a man named Josiah. And he continued until the Babylonians came in and destroyed the town and the city of Jerusalem. We were just in Jerusalem, and we went to the Wailing Wall. The only thing left of the original temple is that western wall where you see people praying. We were praying there just a few days ago. And uh, while we were there, there was a, a young man having a bar mitzvah, and he was becoming a man, and he was, uh, they were reading scripture, and they were praying, and uh, I prayed at the western or the wailing wall. But Jeremiah was there when that temple was torn down. He started off, and there was a great revival going on in Judah, Israel, the northern kingdoms had already been taken into captivity and uh, by the Assyrians, but then Judah fell as well while he was a man of God and he was preaching there. He was a man of great consecration. He was totally dedicated to the proclamation of the Word of God. And I think that we need in our day some young preachers to rise up. Somebody asked me, does our country have any hope? And I said, well, yes, there's, to me there's one hope that God would raise up a new generation of young preachers that will preach the Word of God. I really want you to put that on your prayer list. Pray that God would raise up a new generation of preachers that will preach the Word of God, that will be consecrated. The Bible describes Jeremiah, he describes himself in Jeremiah 15 verse 17, I did not sit in the company of the merrymakers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone because your hand, O oh God, was upon me. Jeremiah said, I didn't have time for the foolishness that many young men get involved in. He said, I was consecrated. I was set apart. I was supposed to proclaim the Word of God. He was also a man of great courage. He was like the Apostle Paul in so many ways. He was arrested. He was imprisoned. He was beaten frequently because he preached the gospel. He was mocked. He was ridiculed even by the priest of his day. They said, you are crazy. You have gone nuts. You think that the Babylonians are going to be able to come into the great city of Jerusalem. You think that God will allow that to happen. How many of you know that God will allow his children to be disciplined if they don't walk with him? Anybody know that? Sure. That's what Jeremiah was preaching. He was saying, if you'll repent, there's still time. But if you don't repent, if we don't get right with God, 
God is our greatest enemy, not the Babylonians, but God. We need to be more afraid of God than we are of anyone else. If we won't live for him, he will discipline us. And so he was a man of great courage. He kept right on preaching. Even though he was rebuked by kings, he was rebuked by false prophets and many other people. He was a man of consecration, a man of courage. He was also a man of compassion. He's known as the weeping prophet. Actually, he wrote the book of Lamentations. How would you like to have your name on the book of Lamentations? Lamentations was, it's one of the saddest books in the Bible because it tells about how the people of God had sinned and they would not repent and God allowed some of the most pagan people in the world to come and discipline his children. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 1, Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. If you read uh, Lamentations, you'll see him sitting in the streets, looking around at all the dead bodies that had not been buried, and they were just allowed to be, uh, just, just literally to be in the streets, and there's a stench all over Jerusalem. I don't know how else to say it. And he was looking around and he was saying, how did we ever come to this? How did we ever allow such a great nation to go down like this? He was a man of great compassion. And he was a man of great communication. He was a preacher. He was God called. He was God commissioned. He was God consecrated. Sometimes he'd get discouraged and think about quitting The Bible says one of the most famous statements in the Old Testament in Jeremiah 20 verse 9, he had been talking about how he felt depression, he felt despair. Jeremiah was talking about himself. He said, Lord, I I want sometimes just to to get out of this thing. I'd like to be a regular person. I'd like to be able not to have this burden upon me. But then he said in Jeremiah 20 verse 9, but if I say I will not remember the Lord or speak any more in his name, then in my heart it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I'm weary of holding it in. I cannot endure it. I don't think there's a better role model in the Bible for anyone who aspires to enter the gospel ministry than Jeremiah. Consecration, a man of consecration, a man of courage, a man of compassion, a man who communicated the word of God. You know, it's not easy to be a gospel preacher, especially in our day. It's emotionally demanding. It is physically demanding. It's spiritually draining. And plenty of people, and this is in no way to try to make you feel sorry for anybody, but plenty of people have advice for preachers when it comes to preaching. Did you know that? It's amazing. I've been on several airplanes lately, and I didn't see anybody go to the cockpit and say, let me, I want to talk to you about how you fly this plane. I don't think they did. I think they would have been escorted off the plane. I don't see too many people right before they go into surgery, and I say, now, sir, doctor, uh, come here. Let me talk to you about how to perform this surgery on my body. I don't hear anybody really doing that. Maybe there are some people. I don't hear a lot of people talk to a farmer and say, before you go out there with your John Deere tractor, I've never driven a tractor, but I'd like to tell you how to plant your corn. Are you getting where I'm coming from? Or how a lawyer, I want to tell you how to try this case. I've never been in a case. I've never really done this, but I want to tell you how to be a lawyer. You don't hear that much. You don't hear about people telling pilots how to fly planes or doctors how to perform surgeries or farmers how to plant crops or lawyers how to try a case. But when it comes to the gospel ministry, there's a lot of people that are very willing and ready to tell someone how they ought to do their work. Indeed, men need to understand that there is an easier way than gospel ministry to make a living So if you enter this ministry, I believe, see, I believe I'm talking to somebody tonight that God's calling to preach. And I want to say this to you. The best advice I ever was given 
And I received it multiple times when I was younger. If you can do anything else with a clear conscience besides preach the Word of God, do it. If you can do anything else with a clear conscience besides preaching the Word of God, then do it because you're not called. But if you say, I've got that fire in my bones, and listen to me, the devil himself will not be able to prevent you from preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's look just at the call of God. Jeremiah chapter 1. You say, Brother Steve, where are the screens? They are in my notes, all right? First thing I would say is God's call for a man to preach is providential. That is, God does the calling. This is not something that you just go and say, well, I just believe I'll be a preacher. I believe I'll be a prophet. I believe I'll be in the ministry. No, you have to be called. Look at chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priest who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came. Underline that. Highlight that. To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also, that is the call of God, the word of the Lord. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the exile of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Notice in verse 2, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Jeremiah didn't go looking for the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came looking for Jeremiah. Jeremiah didn't go looking for the call of God. The call of God came looking for Jeremiah. God came after him. God initiated the call. God extended the call. It came at a very unlikely time. There was a great deal of sin in the land of Judah, except for righteous Josiah, the other kings mentioned in our text were noted for their love and devotion, were not noted for their love and devotion for the Lord. They were filled with idolatry, their hearts were, and so as goes the leadership, so goes the people. And the Bible says that the whole country was worshiping pagan gods. Three times in the book of Jeremiah, you hear this, ex, this just exceptionally unbelievable verse. You have sacrificed your children to Baal, a thing which I did not command, nor did it ever enter my mind. Whenever we go to Israel, we go by a valley, the valley of Ben-Hinnom. Jesus used the word Gehenna to describe hell. And he did that because it's the same word for Ben Hinnom, the valley of Hinnom. And it, it was the place where people dumped their garbage. But it was also the place where they had these idols to Molech and to Baal. And they would literally sacrifice their children. Now, I won't go into the details because we have children in the room, but I will tell you this. What Jesus was saying is this, hell is like the valley of Hinnom. It is the garbage dump of the universe. And when the Lord called this great man of God, people were sacrificing their children to Baal and Molech. It's fascinating how people get caught up in the occult and how they get caught up like they were in the days of, Mole, of uh, Jeremiah when they were worshiping Molech and Baal. They had mediums, they had priests, child sacrifice, very much like the day in which we live in America. Amen. On every corner, there's some type of spiritual person that's not godly. They're trying to predict your future. I got news for you. Don't waste your money on somebody trying to read your palm and give you your future. If you want to know what's going to happen in the future, go read the Word of God. Read the book of Revelation. Jeremiah lived in that kind of day. 
But God gave him a providential call. He was in a place in the middle of a moral mess. In the middle of all of that, God called a prophet. I can remember being on an airplane one time, going with Dr. Rogers to a meeting that we had once a year. We met in Atlanta, and he and I rode down together, and it was a group of pastors that meets once a year. I still go to that meeting sometime. It's called the Mega Metro Conference, and I was showing him something that a man named Don Miller, who was a great prayer warrior, showed me, and uh, I want to show it to you. Everybody turn over to Luke chapter 3 real quickly, just very quickly. Sometimes people say, you know, God's got to get everything right politically before he can move. How many of you know that that is not true? Does anybody know that's not true? God doesn't have to have perfect politics to send his spiritual power. And we look in Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, and the Word of God came to somebody that's very much like Elijah, a great prophet of God, but he came at a very awkward time when it comes to politics. Look at Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, one of the, the most ungodly people you've ever even thought about, when Pontius Pilate, another ungodly person, was governor of Judea, and Herod, boy, we know he was ungodly, was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, Herod stole his own brother's wife. Philip was tetrarch of the regions of Italy and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene. Every one of those were just pagan as they could be. But that was the Roman leadership in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. Those are the people that would actually put Jesus on a cross. So here you have a corrupt priesthood and corrupt politicians. But it says the Word of God came to John. The Word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. He came into all the district around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever God calls somebody to the gospel ministry, it's because he has an assignment for them, a message for them, and God doesn't have to have a perfect setting for all of that to take place. God calls people to preach and God providentially does so. He might send a warrior like David. He called him to be a great leader. He might send somebody who's a builder like Solomon. He might send a soul winner like Philip the deacon. He might send a young man like Mark. He might use an older man like John when he wrote the book of Revelation. He might use a brilliant scholar like the apostle Paul. He might use uneducated fishermen like he did with James and John and Peter. He might use someone who has trouble speaking, a tongue-tied person like Moses. He might use someone who is eloquent like Apollos. He might even use you. He might even use me. God calls people providentially. God doesn't see on the outside. He's not looking that way. He's not trying to see if you're handsome or big or strong. He's trying to look and say, what is your heart like? God providentially calls who he will call when he wants to call them to the ministry that he has for them. God is in charge of the call. It's a providential call. Secondly, it's a powerful call. Go back now to Jeremiah chapter 1 very quickly and look at verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, alas, Lord God, behold, I don't know how to speak because I am a youth. I'm just in the youth group over here, Lord. I I'm just a young guy. I'm just a little teenage boy over here. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth because everyone, everywhere I send you, you shall go. And all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them for I, will deli I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord God. God didn't need Jeremiah's strength. God didn't need Jeremiah's gifting. He, instead, he intended to work through his weakness. That's the way God is, is it not? I mean, 
God works not through your strength, but through your weakness. God takes where you are inadequate and he becomes your adequacy. He, he is the one who strengthens you in your inner man. Jeremiah said, Lord, Lord, I'm green. I'm, I'm young. I'm inexperienced. But he had a heart for God. He wanted to allow the power of God to flow through him. And God wanted to use this young prophet. That's exactly how God does things. Again, you can read about the Apostle Paul and what he said to the Corinthians. It's a very famous text out of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Just listen as I read it. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things which are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. I pray this verse every day. By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that just as it is written let him who boasts boast in the Lord and then he goes right on into chapter 2 and listen to this very quickly and when I came to you brethren I did not come with superiority of speech Paul said of wisdom or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified I was with you in weakness asthenia I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power for, of God. Exactly what Jeremiah was saying, that the call of God is not based on the ability of man. The call of God is based on the power of Almighty God. There's somebody here tonight maybe that the Lord is going to call to use in a mighty way. I'm praying that God will raise up people to take the shoes of Billy Graham and Adrian Rogers. Remember that old song, Who's Going to Fill Their Shoes? Does anybody remember anything like that? Uh, George Jones, Who's Going to Fill Their Shoes of the Grand Ole Opry? I've got a great response to that. Who cares? Who cares going to? who's going to fill the shoes, who sings at the Grand Ole Opry. But I want to know who's going to fill the shoes of Billy Graham. Who's going to fill the shoes of Adrian Rogers. Who's going to fill the shoes of Jerry Falwell. Who's going to fill the shoes of John Wesley. Who's going to fill the shoes of all these great preachers that have come and gone. We need some George Whitfields. We need somebody to stand up and preach the Word of God. We need somebody to be in a pulpit somewhere, or if you don't have a pulpit, to make their own pulpit and go out like John the Baptist and preach in the wilderness and say, thus saith the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and He has consecrated me to preach the kingdom of God. I want to say this to you. America still has hope because of God and he can still call preachers, and this country can still be turned around if young men will hear the call of God like Jeremiah did. I will say this to you. It's a powerful call, but you got to stay in submission. Years ago, my wife had a lady come up to her just out of the blue. I still believe it was just as prophetic as it could be. And she said to my wife, sweetheart, just stay little enough for God to use you. Just stay little enough for God to use you. God will give you a powerful call to preach. God uses nobodies to do awesome things for his glory. It was a providential call, a powerful call. It was a purposeful call too. Look at verse 9. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9 very quickly. Then the Lord stretched out his hand. He touched my mouth. The Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations, over the kingdoms. Now listen to what he was supposed to do. To pluck up, to break down, to destroy, to overthrow, and then to build and to plant. Notice 
Jeremiah's ministry was going to be both destructive and constructive. Destructive, God said, I'm going to use you to pluck some things up. You're going to pull some things out of the ground. You're going to mess with people's ministry. You're going to mess with the priest out here. You're going to pluck some things up. You're going to break some other things down. And then you're going to destroy some things. You're even going to overthrow some things. You're going to preach the Word. You're going to pluck up sin, break down demonic strongholds, destroy pagan idolatry, and overthrow the work of the devil among God's people here in Judah. You're going to do those things, Jeremiah, because you're my man. You're going to be destructive toward the enemy, but you're going to be constructive toward me. You're going to build up in many other ways. And sometimes you have to do both. You have to build and to plant, but you also have to pluck up, to break down, to destroy, and to overthrow. You have to do both in ministry. The Bible says, if you read it in uh, Jeremiah chapter uh, 9, it goes on in verse 11, the word of the Lord came to me saying, what do you see, Jeremiah? He said, I see a a rod of an almond tree. It's the Hebrew word sheked. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I'm watching over, and that's the word for shoked, very similar, my word to perform it. I'm watching over my word to perform it. The word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. And the Lord said to me, out of the north, the evil will break forth on all the inhabitants of the land for behold, I'm calling all the families of the kingdom of the north, declares the Lord, and I will come and I will set each one on his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem and against all its walls around about and against all the cities of Judah. I will pronounce my judgments on them concerning all their wickedness, whereby they have forsaken me and have offered sacrifices to other gods and worshiped the, wor the works of their own hands. Jeremiah's call was a purposeful call. God was calling him. He said, I'm, I'm calling you to tell them that there's trouble coming from the north. Again, just got back from Israel. And whenever anybody invaded Israel, they invaded from the north. And he's talking about the Babylonians. And if you look back in history, every time anybody invaded, it was from the north. He said, I've got some boiling going on in the north. There's some trouble coming from Dan in the north. They're going to invade in a few years if my people don't get right with God. Jeremiah's call was a purposeful call. God had called him to minister to a people that were just about to be punished. And God had his hand upon this young man. Also happened to Paul in Acts 26 when he told Festus and Felix and all those people about his call to the ministry. He said in Acts chapter 26, Paul said, God said to me, but get up and stand on your feet for this purpose. I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness to not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from the darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may have received forgiveness of sins, and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. God has a purpose. God has a calling for somebody. It may be somebody here tonight. You say, I'm struggling with this with Brother Steve. I, I feel in my bones that God wants me to do something in the ministry, and I don't know what to do. Listen to me. You just get right with God. You walk with God, and God will show you his purpose for you just like he did for Jeremiah. The call of God very quickly is providential. It comes from God. You don't go and volunteer for the ministry. You have to be called. And it's powerful. God will empower you to do what he calls you to do. And it's purposeful. God's got a track he wants you in on. He knows exactly where he wants you to be, when you need to be there, and exactly what you need to have in your heart when you show up. But there's one more thing. I love this. God's call is not only providential and powerful and purposeful, but it is a protective call. Look very quickly in chapter 1, verses 17 through 19. Now, gird up your loins. You know what that means? Get some strength in your heart. Gird up your loins and arise. Literally means put your big boy pants on. Gird up your loins. Speak to them. All which I command you. Don't be dismayed before them. 
or I will dismay you before them. Did you hear that? Don't you be dismayed before these people to whom you preach, or I will dismay, dis, dismay you before them. Behold, I have made you today as a fortified city, as a pillar of iron, and as walls of bronze against the whole land to the kings of Judah, to its princes, to its priests, and to the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they will not overcome you, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. And if you go forward, 15 chapters, he says almost the exact same thing in Jeremiah 15, verses 19 and following. He said, therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, then I will restore you. Before me, you will stand. And if you will extract the precious from the worthless, that's what preaching is. It's taking all this good gold out of the Bible. If you will extract the precious from the worthless, you will become my spokesman. They, for their part, may turn to you. The people to whom you preach, they may turn to you. But as for you, you must not turn to them. Then I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze, and though they fight against you, they will not prevail over you, for I am with you to save you and to deliver you, declares the Lord. So I will deliver you from the hand of the wicked. I will redeem you from the grasp of the violent. Jeremiah was going to have it very rough for four decades. But God promised to protect him. Dr. Rogers and I talked a lot, and one of the things he said constantly was this, the ministry will not be all honey and no bees. There is no trouble-free job, he said, in the ministry. The ministry is not all honey and no bees. There is no trouble-free job in the gospel ministry. But God, nevertheless, will protect his preachers. You remember when God called Joshua? He said in Joshua chapter 1, Joshua, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you, Joshua. I will not forsake you, Joshua. Be strong and courageous, son, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, Joshua, my son. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you to do. And do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. I know it's a Sunday night. I know it's January. I get it. But I believe there's somebody here tonight. Maybe you're 15 years old. Maybe you're 25, maybe you're 35, I don't know. You may be 75. But God's calling you. God's saying to you, I want to use you. And you're struggling with it. And you're saying, God can't use me. You'd be surprised what God can do. You say, well, I just don't think he would use something. You'd be surprised what God will do. You'd be surprised. And if God calls you, it will be providential. That call will come to you. You won't be able to shake it. It will be a powerful call. God will empower you. You say, I don't know how to do this. Don't worry about that. God's got it. It will be a purposeful call. God's got a purpose and a plan for you. He knows how he wants to use you. And it will be a protective call. He will protect you until it's time to go home and be with the Lord. Let's bow just for a moment. Would you just pray right now that God would raise up a new generation of preachers across America? That's what we try to do on Sunday nights, is it not, is to add a little bit of em emphasis to prayer. Would you just, if you're by somebody right now, would you just take their hand and say, let's pray for God to raise up preachers like Jeremiah across America. How many of you believe God will answer a prayer like that? Anybody believe that? I do. Take the hand of somebody right now and just pray. Lord, raise up some Jeremiah's. 
Lord, raise up some political leaders like David and Josiah and Hezekiah. Lord, raise up some prophets. Raise up some Jeremiah's. Raise up some John the Baptist. Raise up some Isaiah's. Raise up some Ezekiel's, Lord. Lord God, raise up some John the Baptists. Raise up some Elijah's. Raise up some Billy Graham's. Raise up some Adrian Rogers. Raise them up, Lord. Call some young men to preach. Call some young women to teach. Call people, Lord. Do it providentially. Let them say, I, I can't shake this. I've got fire in my bones. That's what we need. We need the fire of God. We don't need anybody that's self-called. We need somebody who can't do anything else but share the gospel. Father, I thank you for this church. And I pray and I ask you, Lord, to let your good hand rest upon this church and I pray Heavenly Father that you will call people to the gospel ministry in Jesus name if that's your prayer say amen let's all stand up we're going to sing a song of worship and tonight if you sense the Lord calling you to preach or calling you to some type of ministry why don't you just come and tell one of the pastors. I want our pastors to come very quickly and they'll be glad to receive you. Tonight, if you don't know the Lord, if you've never been saved, would you come and give your heart to Jesus Christ? And then tonight, if you have been saved but you've never publicly expressed that the Bible way through baptism, would you come and obey the Lord and set up a time to be baptized? If you don't have a church home and you say, I, I need a church family and I believe God would have me to join Bellevue, would you come tonight and start that process? And again, if you feel called in some type of ministry, maybe you're a young woman here tonight and you say, I want to be a missionary. Or I want to be a teacher. I want to be in women's ministry. I want God to use me. God calls women. He doesn't call them to pastor a church, but he does call them into the ministry. And God calls men to preach the Word of God. If, if you sense that in your heart, would you just come? And, and you say, well, I don't, I, I'm just not sure. Look, that's fine. Let somebody pray with you. We're not going to try to talk you into the ministry. I wouldn't do that to you, all right? <laughs> I'm just telling you, not that I don't like the ministry, but I, I wouldn't try to call you if you're not called. And you get in trouble with God if you did that. I wouldn't do that. But if you sense, if you're just not clear on it, then come. Let somebody pray with you. I love this song that we're going to sing. It's a perfect song. Have thine own way, Lord. I surrender all. I surrender all. Let's pray and just, if you need to come, you come. Father, bless. Pour out your spirit. We do surrender right now. Whatever you want, dear God, whatever you want. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing. If you need, if, by the way, if you need healing, if you want that, you want that to be prayed for, they'll be praying for right over there at the life. Raise your hands over there, guys. I think everybody knows where you are. But they'll anoint you with oil and pray for you tonight if you'd like that. Let's sing. You come right now. Oh, to Jesus I surrender.
Let's thank the Lord for being with us tonight. Amen. I like those guys singing that little deal at the end there. I surrender all. Don't you like that? I grew up on that now. That was Howard Guthrie and his bunch back there in the back. All right. I went to his funeral not long ago. and I, Every time I think of Howard Guthrie, I think about him doing that very thing and uh, growing up on those hymns. Well, it's been a good day with the Lord, and uh, thank you for being here. We had a great time this morning, and just unusual. I felt the presence of God in a real strong way. I feel Him here tonight. You know, a lot of people wonder, should we have Sunday night services? We've got several hundred people here who prayed over several hundred requests, and I would say that all the people that wrote those requests would say, yeah, you need to have that service, if nothing else, just to be praying for people like me. And uh, I, I think it's good to meet on Sunday night. There are times that we don't do it. We won't meet next Sunday night. But we will have most of the Sunday nights will be here. And we don't make a big advertisement about it. We just come and we sing and we pray and we preach. And look at me, that's enough. We don't need to have some show all the time. Amen. I'm not saying we have shows. I'm just saying we, we just need in, in, our, in our lives, we just need to pray, preach, and sing, and worship the Lord. And that never gets old. So thank you for coming tonight. Let me pray for you, and we'll be dismissed. Again, thank you for coming out tonight. And Brother Mark, thank you for leading worship. Beautiful job tonight. Lord, thank you for these precious people. Bless them. Keep them. Make your face shine upon them. Be gracious unto them. Lift up your countenance upon them, Lord, and give them your shalom, your peace. Father, we pray, and we know that as long as there's prayer, there's hope. Lord, if we don't have hope, we don't have anything. So as long as there's prayer, there's hope, because we know that you do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think when we pray. We really believe that things are different after we pray than they were before we prayed, or we wouldn't have prayed. So, Lord, we ask you in the name of Jesus to have your hand upon this nation, and we pray that you'll raise up a new generation of preachers. Lord, that will fill the shoes of the people I've already talked about. God, we need some Jeremiah's. We need some real prophets of God that will come, that can't be bought out, talked out, pushed away, shoved away, marginalized. God, we need men of God to lead in worship, to work with students, to disciple, to preach, to teach. We need for you to raise up a new generation, dear God, with fire in their bones. And Lord God, we pray that you'll do it. Have mercy on America, dear God, please, and raise up a new generation of God-called preachers like Jeremiah. Consecrate them from their mother's womb, dear God, and fill them with the Holy Spirit and call them to preach. Do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think. Do it all for your glory. And now, Lord, go with us this week. Have your hand upon us. Give us opportunities to share the gospel. Give us opportunities to pray with people. Give us opportunities to encourage people. Lord, through a spoken word, through a phone call, through an email, through a handwritten note we might send to encourage somebody. Lord, help us this week to be sensitive about other people and their needs, not so focused on ourselves. We'll give you praise. In Jesus' name, and if that's your prayer, say amen. amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. Have a great week walking with the Lord Jesus.